after you smash that subscribe button, go over to sportscaster.com where you will see us every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Sunday Drive here on Hashtag Sports. I am Mario Granada. Over here, I have a very special guest. I'm sure if you cheer for the Bills, you talk about the Bills, Bills media, Bills, everything like that's concerned with that, you know about this guy, Rico from Bills Buffalo Fanatics. I'm sorry, I almost said Bills Fanatics. I almost went back in the Wayback Machine. Oh, no, you can go with Buffalo <laughs> Fanatics, baby, yeah. <laughs> so uh, he's, he is, uh, he's been generous enough to donate some of his time to Hashtag Sports today to talk about the, uh, Buffalo Bills, and we have some great topics for you today. Uh, but without mixing words, uh, if you want, you can go right underneath his picture right there and go to Buffalo Fanatic, uh, Buff Fanatics. Please give them a follow. Right out of the gate, Rico, I want to talk about the blue-red practice scrimmage, whatever they want to call it now. Let's your go. your observations on what happened and how the team, because we had, uh, the Bills had uh, eight notable guys. Uh, we're talking about McCoy, Brown, Niseki, Morris, Long, Hyde, Edmonds, and Zoe, all not practicing in there. So mm. what is your take on the blue-red practice, given those eight players weren't involved in it? It's gonna sound very unpopular, but um, the the blue red game, it, it didn't really do it for me because of how many guys were out. Okay. So how how are you to evaluate uh, your full Bills team when key key parts of the team are missing? So yes, it's great to show to to get an opportunity to get depth guys in there. I I absolutely love that, but I want to see what the team is gonna look like with a full unit. So you don't get that. Um, so I, I missed out on that. I didn't feel I didn't feel great about it. Um, but there were some some major takeaways um, that stood out to me. Um, and the major one, and I think you and I will both agree on that, is our center, Mitch yes. Moore being out. Um, it's a and I've spoke on this before, and I'm sure you've spoken on this as well. It's a cause for major concern. We yes. are paying this man forty four million dollars. Highest paid center in the game. Um, and we took a risk. We took a risk knowing full well that he had history um, with concussion um, injuries. And we said, you know what? We're going to roll the dice. Maybe it's behind him. But guess what? Right in front of him. And it's right in front of everybody right now. So all eyes are on the medical staff to make sure that this man is protected and um, they really take care of him uh, in this concussion protocol. But having Russell Bodine in John Feliciano in uh, Spencer long with a rotation, it really messes up the chemistry of the line. We tried to, I mean, there's nothing you can do about these injuries. It happens, yeah. but it, it's a, it's such a difference when the man that hasn't allowed a sack for almost a year and a half a season and a half is out of the lineup and you got Russell Bodine back in and there's no slight on Russell Bodine. Yeah. The fact is, we paid a man to be the, the the quarterback of that line, and we don't have him. So we're back to, you know what I mean, shuffling of the cards. And it's, it's disheartening. But um, we just need him back, and we need to get uh, back on track and, and protect Josh Allen. What did you feel? What did, what stood out for you? Well, as far as the – if I can get to your Bodine uh, comment really quick. When you talk about this team, this is why, you know, a lot of fans that don't know, this, this is why rosters are at 90 right now because you, you have to try to account for these injuries. There was a reason why – Early in free agency, they picked up. They tried to get. Um, they tried to get Morris. They then they got Long, so they got two centers. Then you get Feliciano, who has, uh, you know, familiarity with OG Bobby Johnson, the line mm -hmm. coach. So That's you have all of these parts in in place for the Buffalo Bills. You know, Bodine. I, you know, we use a word a lot on hashtag sports, and it's called serviceable. He's serviceable. He's fine. He's not going to be. You yeah. know, outstanding, but he's fine. But like you said, the communication about, among those front five has to be paramount because we saw how bad it was last year when all chaos broke loose. Josh Allen was running for his life. The running game couldn't get off the ground. It was awful. But I would like to sit, take a little bit of a different slant to it with because Feliciano has that experience with the line coach, he knows the calls. He, I think he could get guys where they need to go as far as Feliciano. Mm -hmm. But – what happens is you end up creating a void at that right guard spot. Now, could Long play it? Yeah, Long could play it. Could Teller? Could a couple of these other guys do it? Yeah, they could do it. But I think in, in everyone's mind, Morse and Feliciano at center and guard are your best options with Spain on the left side. And uh, like like you said, these injuries. Now, the 20-year-old me 
would talk about, oh, Morris, he's got a concussion. Get in there. You know, you got to play. Oh, we want to build small stuff. Absolutely. Be, being the age that I am now, I'm worried about uh-huh. the health of this guy. I want to make sure, okay, do I want the Bills to win? Absolutely. But I want to make sure this guy's okay for the rest of his life. You know, he's kind of worrisome <laughs> with all these concussions that he's having. It's funny that you mention that because we are maturing. Maturing is what we're doing, right? So like, like you said, like the 22, 23, 24-year-olds, like, man, shake it off and get back in there. You play football. I play football. I play – did you play quarterback, right? You play quarterback? Yes, I did. Yeah. All right, we'll talk about that a little after. But um, <laughs> uh, And I played the running back position. And there are times where I got I got yeah. nucked. I got bucked real good. And shake it off. It's just a big – you know, I got snot bubbles blown out of my face. So let's get, let's get back into it. But – if I'm and I and I played a little bit of semi pro ball like maybe a few years ago, and I had to really think about it. I'm like, listen, I got a family, I got kids. I'm like, I go out and and injure myself for a major concussion. What am I doing for? Right? And I'm not even, I'm not being paid for that. Yeah. So so it makes you think as you mature, as you get older, guys like Morse himself are gonna like, yeah, listen, I'm feeling something. Before I get myself back out there, let let's make sure that I'm 100 percent good to go, and I'm and I'm with that. That being said. You mentioned something that made me kind of think uh, uh, of something else here. Uh, I've been mentioning uh, to bring and move over Cody Ford to right guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel that it, Laramie Tunsil, and I use this example a lot. Laramie Tunsil, uh, a standout tackle, um, drafted by Miami. They didn't stick him out to, to tackle right off the bat. They inserted him inside, let him get his, his experience with interior rush passes and so on and so forth and move them outside to the, the next year. And that's exactly what they've done. And he's excelled extremely well. I can't see why we can't do that with Cody Ford. So I bring this up for a reason because Mitch Morse is out, um, I guess, getting himself right uh, mm-hmm. and making sure that he's, he's correct and ready to get back into the game. Feliciano, his relationship with OG Bobby Johnson <laughs> totally makes sense. What you said, because, because he's familiar with how, um, Bobby Johnson likes to have his scheme run and so on and so forth. He could be that that leader that gets things and people in line. So it, it allows us to move over Cody Ford to right guard. Tyna Seke and Seke now goes to right tackle mm-hmm. and we somewhat have a formidable line, right? There's trust factor with co- offensive coach with center. Yep. Allen is going to have to get his relationship right with John Feliciano. And then we can go from there. But the fact that you mentioned that kind of makes me now uh, open the idea of Feliciano being the the ultimate backup center if Morse does not return. Yeah, it's uh, I, I I took a little bit of a different slant. I, I mean, I love the fact that they're shuffling guys around that line because in, in order to understand what the responsibilities are of the guy playing next to you, what better way to do that than to play that position yourself? Uh with the contract that Naseki was given in this offseason, how he was one of the first guys that they signed. I mean, we, we joked about it on hashtag sports. We called him uh, Trent Brown light. And uh, because, you know, Trent Brown had that huge contract, he went to Oakland right. and, and I guess he was, he's actually working at guard, which is making me laugh. As far as that goes, you, you pay him, he's the highest paid tackle. Now you shift him down the guard. And that happens to be the, what happens with a lot of these players. If, if they get drafted at tackle and they're starting to struggle or they're starting to, they're not really finding their way. A lot of teams will slide him inside just so they can get their feet underneath them. Like you said, with Tunsil and then, you know, gradually they can probably put them outside. But mo- most of the time, those players end up, when they go inside, they get so comfortable and they end up producing so well that once you have a guy like that, I mean, Quentin Nelsons don't come around every year. It's nope. That just doesn't happen. So what they like to do is they like to keep those guys inside. Uh, I like Nisek- the idea of Naseki at either tackle. Um, Me too. With, with Deion Dawkins struggling a bit in this camp, I know it's early. We only had two weeks of camp. He and I, I do realize that he is going up against Jerry Hughes, who gives everyone problems in the in the NFL. Uh, do you think that could be a case where they like Ford at right and they want to put Naseki at left, uh, probably to wake Deion Dawkins up, or do you think this is a situation where they're gonna they draft the Dawkins, they have faith in him, they think he's gonna be their left tackle, and they're just gonna let Naseki swing in wherever he's needed? I'm gonna go with the latter. Um, and okay. I, I've I've I pondered this many times. Um, and at the beginning of preseason, excuse me, at the beginning of off season, um, I always in the back of my mind had and Seke slotted in that left tackle because you don't pay a 33, 34 year old that much money yeah. to come and sit and swing on another team. You might as well just let him sit on the free agency and go young. 
right? They didn't do that. They brought him in for a reason. So at the beginning of my thought process, it was and Seke at left. And when I went down the line, Deion Dawkins was on the, I wouldn't say the bubble per se, but it was it was shaky because they didn't bring in Spain, one of the better left guards in the game, for no reason again. And he was one of the top guards in the game last year. Mm-hmm. Why he he they would he wasn't assigned early in offseason, don't know, but we have him. Then you move over to center, then the right guard. But Dawkins has struggled at right guard when they when his rookie year, when they tried to move him around all over the place, he was not slated as a right guard, mm-hmm. right? So I, I struggled with that. So I thought he was on the bubble. Now, and Seke going left tackle, I I I really truly think um Sean McDermott, um Bobby Johnson really want to give him his shot at left tackle. From what I'm reading and seeing, um, he's holding his own at left tackle. Yes, does he have moments of of lapses and struggles? Absolutely. But he's still holding his own. He's been starting at left tackle all the way through. Yeah. And Seke, I would love to see at right tackle where he's comfortable, where he's done it, uh, and having Ford at right guard. Um, I like that. That would be dirty. I like that lineup. I really do. Right. So, and what I, and the premise of that for that right guard is because you can put him between two veteran linemen. You have Mitch Morse. Once he's in, Mm -hmm. I got to in the game long enough that can mentor the young guy. And right over to his right side would be Enseke sitting there. So you've got a wealth of knowledge right beside you in between both men and you, you excel. So next year, Enseke gets a year older, Ford moves over to right tackle. And there we have it. I really think they're going to give Dawkins his opportunity. This is his third year. He knows he had an off year last year. I don't want to say terribly. I want to say off year. Yeah. He, knows he can do better. So I think they're going to give him every single opportunity um, to start at left left tackle. One little caveat, though. Uh, from what I, I've read, that they wanted to give him, Dawkins, all the opportunity in the world to start at left tackle. However, they're starting to sprinkle in Ty and Seke. So mm-hmm. that is a nugget. So we have to keep that in mind. So are they as uh, thrilled with Dawkins at left tackle? Maybe. But the fact that they're sprinkling in now, Ty and Seke at left tackle, that is something to pay attention to. I mean, that's a, that's a great point you may, you bring up. As far as that goes, that could be their backup plan. If in the case Morse unfortunately can't play, then yes. it seems like you're just bumping guys down. And you put... Feliciano at center, you put Ford at, at, at right guard, and then you put Na, uh, Ty N- uh, Niseki in there in case he happens to struggle. A lot of guys, and this is probably a, a great transition to talking about, uh, you know, I know you wanted to get up and talk about the defense. Um, yep. If if that happens to, you know, what you said about Deion Dawkins, is they're, they're giving him every ample uh, opportunity to be the starter at left tackle for this team. We flip mm-hmm. over to the defensive side of the ball, Leslie Frazier, when he was talking about Levi Wallace, you know, talking yeah. about being the incumbent. Listen, it's his job to lose. Maybe that could be the same situation with Deion Dawkins. Listen, we're going to give him every opportunity to be successful. We're going to put him next to these guys. Quentin Spain was next to Taylor Lewan all last year, so he could definitely give him some information on how Taylor Lewan would approach the game or how he would uh, do certain techniques and whatnot. Now if we shift over to the defensive side of the ball, I know you were really curious with the, with the uh, blue-red practice about – depth guys they're starting to get some work in and all the rotations that are coming in what have you observed so far from the rotations that the bills are using at camp in the first two weeks absolutely i'm not gonna i'm not gonna dismiss that last point you made by the way great point on Deion dawkins is your job to lose and it's gonna be his job to lose Mm -hmm. um moving on to the defense um what i'm really impressed about um is the front line we already know who uh the guys that are like who have been enthralled into this this defense Jerry Hughes, you've got uh, Jordan Phillips making a lot of noise and not and not allowing um, any uh, no errors, very yeah. little error because you know this game is about little inches, right? So you make a little mistake here, a little mistake there, somebody's taking your spot. So he's doing a really good job of keeping uh, our our rookie at bay for now. So that front four is fantastic, you know what I mean? And then you got depth um, with uh, Harrison Phillips. Um, and you've got, you know, your Eddie Yarbrough's, but one one specific position um, that two positions, two two spots, I should say. Mm-hmm. Mike Love is making a push for defensive line number four, defensive and DE number four. Um, and I'm 
disappointed that <laughs> Foshan Joseph is <laughs> not making noise. I'm disappointed, man. We draft you in the fifth round. And I know that's not that's 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 not like he's an integral piece into the team. I get that part, but I expected a little bit more from Voshan. And some people, yeah. they some players, they they get into a system slowly sometimes. Some things get to them too a little slower than most. But this is the NFL, man. You don't have the time for that. You've got to really put your nose in the books. And I'm not saying he's not, but you have to. But I expect a lot more from him. Now, Corey Thompson came in late last year. Made a little bit of noise. We we're kind of wondering who, who this Corey Thompson is. Uh, he's really making himself known. He's he's really dashed himself into the second team. Second team linebacking crew. It goes uh, Stanfield. Excuse me. I'm saying I'm saying um, Julian Stanford. Yep. You've got um, Corey Thompson, and I believe the third linebacker uh, Mo, Mo Alexander. Maurice yep. Alexander. Thank you for that. Yep. So Maurice Alexander. Those guys are. That's your backup squad. Yeah. So Sean is on the outside looking in. So the only way this man is going to make this roster as of right now is special teams. And you better bust your butt on special teams. Yeah, I um, think I think when they when they drafted uh, Joseph, it was it, they admittedly he has a project. They had some things they need to work on with him uh, being a fifth rounder. I mean, Matt Milano's don't come around every year. And it, it's, it's great to see. Uh, the progression of, of Milano and how he is going to be a force this year. We expect him to be a force this year for the Buffalo Bills in 2019. You look at those backups, a, a lot of the, two things. Number one, the amount of rotational defensive front that the Buffalo Bills are, are going to play. If you're a starter, if you're not a starter, that's to me, that's not irrelevant, but it's one of those things where if you're playing 55, 60% of the snaps as the quote unquote starter, when they rotate yeah. you in, you're going to be good. And Phillips, uh, Jordan Phillips specifically has been doing very well at camp. Uh, stuck in between Starla Tule and uh, Jerry Hughes, there's not many, you know, there's not much margin for error in there. You got to take care of your responsibilities, and I, and I like that. I like the progress that Oliver has been making. Harrison Phillips has been doing good, but if we go back to last year, just really quick, you start to yeah. talk about uh, Robert Foster in camp. The first week in camp, he came out of the gates firing. And the reason for that was is because he played with Dable the year before at Alabama. So he knew a lot of the calls, a lot of the similar terminology that was going on. So he got out of the gates pretty fast. Fast forward to now, like what you're talking about with Corey Thompson. Late last year, he comes in. He already has that basis of knowledge, so he doesn't have to think about what he needs to do. He just needs to react and be an athlete. Yes. Joseph, it's a different story. And I understand. I love Joseph as a kid. I think he's one of those guys they are going to probably try to slide to the practice squad with the younger talent that they have brought in because a majority of the time this defense goes into nickel. So what you're doing is you're taking a linebacker off. Well, if you have Mo Alexander out there, who's a hybrid, yes. you, don't, you can go nickel by staying in your base package. And that's what I love what this, what this defense is doing. You're getting all these guys that are playing multiple positions uh, for this team. But the problem is the guys in the secondary and the linebackers, if we talk about it, you talk about Hyde and Poyer in the back end with Kurt Coleman yep. rotating in, mm -hmm. and you got Dean Marlowe. You got Thompson, Sanford, and Alexander uh, as the backups for your linebacking crew. Where did what does this say about Siren Neal and Deion Lacey? Two guys that have been on this team and you know that are fan. I, I've already I've already preluded to the fact that there's fans are gonna have to uh, get used to some names not being here that are that they like because there's so much talent now. In Buffalo, what do you say? What do you? What are your thoughts on Sierra Neal and Deion Lacy, even making the fifty-three? So here's the deal: I really, I really like Saran Neal. I really do, uh, and I, I had high hopes from last year. Now they do have him playing the hybrid role. They have him playing a linebacker. They have him playing at safety and a little bit of and a little bit of slot. Um, so, and I've always known in the work field, the more things you can put your hand in the better it is because it's harder for someone to get rid of you because you can do a lot of everything. But the Deion Lacey, he's more of a special teams guy, but we got so much depth. He's going to have to carve himself um, an opportunity on the field because special teams, we know he that's what he does. But if you want to stay on this team, you've got to be able to, to put yourself in and, and carve yourself a spot on this 53. But it's not looking great for Deion Lacey. I can tell you that. But Saran Neal has a chance. He has an opportunity. If I'm picking Marlo or Saran Neal, uh, I'm gonna go with the 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 youth of Saran Neal mm -hmm. uh, and and 
I'm going to slightly let go of Marlowe. But Deion Lacey, he's on that cusp. He's on that cusp. Yeah, I think if 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 you had to if you had to make a definitive decision as far as Neil versus Marlowe, I, I believe that Neil does still. I have to check this. I'm not 100 percent sure. I think Neil does still have practice squad eligibility. Now you only have a limited number of guys. You've only put right. ten on there. I think he does have practice squad eligibility, whereas Marlowe does not. I'm pretty sure that's that's the case as far as um, years in the league. And you know, I think Marlowe's like 26. So what you really want to do is reserve those practice squad for players that you know, undrafted free agents, fifth round, sixth round, seventh round, where you want to keep them there. Um, and even even in that case, you know, let me correct myself. You draft a guy in the fifth, sixth, seventh round because you want to have a controllable contract for four years. Those undrafted free agents you pick up that you want to work on, those are the ones you usually slide to the practice squad. This defense being second against the pass last year. Yep. What do you – should fans – temper their expectations about this defense or do you think that if if, the, if they have a couple duds fans shouldn't just go crazy with this defense no fans should not temper their 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 expectation for this defense because the defense is going to be what the defense is going to be and it's going to be excellent the question about it we we we, we lost very little starters in the on our defense i think we lost what like out of the 11 guys that we uh, we have, I think we lost two starters, if my memory serves me correct. So, and we're bringing a lot of guys back. We're, and we've got, in my personal opinion, I think we got better on our defense. So this defense is going to hold down this whole team. Um, and I don't want to segue into it just yet, but because this defense is going to be what holds this team down and that keeps us in games, the pressure really mounts on two people. Uh, I think you, I think you know where I'm going with this. Absolutely. But it, pressure mounts on two people, and I think this might be a good segue. Josh Allen and our offensive coordinator, and Brian Dayball. That's where the pressure is gonna is gonna lie because a lot of times this defense against a, a formidable offense, three and out, boom, defense stands up, boom, three and out, defense stands up. But our offense can't capitalize. So. As a defense, what does that do to you? You're sitting there. Come on, guys. Like we we doing our we're doing our part. Mm -hmm. It's time for you guys to start putting some points on the board and so on and so forth. So the pressure now really goes on to second year quarterback Josh Allen and second year offensive coordinator Brian Dayball. What say you on those two individuals? Uh, well, I think before I get to that, I'd like to talk and commend uh, Coach McDermott last year for not letting it separate the team. Because if you have one side of the ball playing really well, the other side of the ball is not playing very well, there's always that possibility of division with the team. And he was able to hold the team together and keep the family mentality of everyone because everyone knew what was going on or what was about to happen once they end up getting more pieces of guys into their program that they like. As far as transitioning over to Dable and Allen, I'm going to say a very unpopular decision for a lot of Bills fans, and I know everyone's riding high with the first two weeks of camp and how Allen is doing because the Buffalo Bills have not had a bona fide starter. And Allen looks to, looks the part. He looks he's the franchise guy. He's what you you know you you quote unquote tanked for to trade picks and move up in the round to get him. People need to temper their expectations about Josh Allen because. He is only in his second year. He's played 12 games. Now, I'm not going the E.J. Manuel route and making excuses that he's only played an X number of games. But the kid played six games running around, you know, playing a game and not really knowing what, what, what was asked of him. Then he got injured. Then he comes back for six games. And it seemed like he started to grasp it near the end of the season. And then that Dolphins game did not help my case when he accounts for five touchdowns against the Dolphins in the right. final final week. But – it seems like he's starting to get it, and that's number one with the expectations of Allen. The other expectations of Allen is because of what you traded to get Allen. You traded out of the 10th spot the year before, and Kansas City has taken Mahomes, and everyone in Buffalo is going, what? 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 The thing that people don't realize is that Mahomes went to Andy Reid. He went to a, a known coach, offensive-minded guy that knows how to get his players in the Yes. Yeah. So Brian Dable, coming from the New England system, he runs the Earnhardt Perkins system, which is, if you've watched New England and every Bills fan has, it's to me it's boring. It's absolutely boring. You're going three, four yards a clip. 
you're taking what the offense, what the defense will give you. You're just nickel and diamond down the field. And while on the defensive side of the ball, you think holding them to three yards is a, is a win. That's exactly what the Patriots want to do. So Dable's coming from that school. So if if uh, the offense isn't too exciting in the first five six weeks of this year, I don't want everyone hitting the panic button on Josh Allen if he's throwing for two twenty five. He's throwing for two ten. Uh, two touchdowns and one pick or anything like that. He's only going to do what's asked of him. And the thing that I love that he's doing in camp is that he's finding his running backs. He wasn't doing that last year. He was always looking for the home run last year. And now he's starting to distribute the ball to short guys and let them be athletes. What have you seen from Dayball and Allen in the first two weeks of camp? The one thing that I I do want to bring up, um, and it's important because there's so much to unpack here. There's so much to unpack. Okay, so Brian Dayball, a lot of uh, Bills fans that follow uh, social media, uh, the follow up from fanatics and so on and so forth, and myself um, specifically, I've had very harsh words about Dable, especially last year. Mm-hmm. Um, then I started to get information, um, and there was a press, there was a, a press conference, and I'm I'm not certain who, I just can't remember, but. Somebody mentioned something to the nature of McDermott having a say in the offense. And it got me thinking. So if he has a say in the offense, how much of a say does he have? And how much does it affect the plan that Brian Dable had for the team? Now, that's one point that I wanted to make. So if Brian Dable had in mind said, okay, this is what this is the what I want to do on this down and distance. And McDermott says, nah, I want you to run the ball because we're not trying to give this ball away, yada, yada, because he knows he's about not giving that ball away, Yeah. right? So let's run this play. So does that handcuff Dable? So I started thinking about that. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, wait a second. So does he have more um, the does he have more liberty to now run this offense as a whole by himself, or is McDermott still going to be having his hand uh, in the offensive scheme, right? So that was one thing that I kind of had to kind of – bring myself back on, on tempering uh, on, excuse me, bring myself back on, on the harsh criticism of Dable. That's number one. Number two, when it comes to Josh Allen, I do believe fans should kind of calm down a little bit. I know he's going in the second year. He's saying all the right things and doing all the right things and staying after practice to sign all the autographs. And he's, he's a really fan favorite guy. Yeah. But when it comes down to the play on the field, This is where he's going to have to step up as a second-year player. Now, a little more depth into this. Last year, it seems as though the, I guess, uh, the front office and the guys that put the work in on on, on the information they put on on grabbing Josh Allen in the draft and all that good stuff, trading up to, to to get him and all that great stuff, right? That's all said and done. Look at the weapons that they brought in for for Josh Allen. They brought in Kelvin Benjamin late in the season, right? Mm-hmm. Um they brought in they 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 bring in um um why am I having a buzz a buzz kill right now? The two the, the Andre Holmes. Yeah. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. So you bring you bring in Duke Williams. Excuse me. Ah. You bring in Andre Holmes, Kelvin Benjamin. You've got those two big boys, right? Mm-hmm. So in my mind the, the management is thinking we're going to try to help him out on his accuracy because we need big body guys with big wingspan. So if he is inaccurate, these big boys will bring in the ball, mm-hmm. right? That didn't work out. No. Andre Holmes hardly got on the field. Kelvin Benjamin gets cut, right? So what do they do? They bring in Isaiah McKenzie, a smaller guy that can get space. Wait a minute. The ball is moving now. The chains are moving. Hold yeah. on a second. So the reason I bring this up is now be, the pressure is more on – Josh Allen this year because he doesn't have that go deep mentality all the time. Let's go into year two now. What do we do? We got a whole bunch of Smurfs, right? <laughs> Cole Beasley's. We got Cole Beasley. <laughs> uh, we, we've got Isaiah McKenzie, smaller guys that can get, get open and get separation. So the reason I say this puts pressure on now, so you can't go deep all the time, Mr. Allen. You're going to have to use the intermediate game. You're going to have to take that short intermediate passes um, to excel yourself as a quarterback. You can't just go deep all day. You can't just roll right and go deep. You're going to have to now stay within the pocket. Now, you mentioned something. You said it kind of went out the window when you tried when against the Dolphins. He had a five-touchdown game. Yeah. Great. Let's go to the game before that, when we played the Patriots. Yeah. I believe it was the game before that. He had a god-awful game. Why? 
because Belichick is a mastermind, number one. Yeah. Number two, Belichick kept him in the pocket. When you keep Allen in the pocket, this is where decision-making comes into play. Mm-hmm. So you've got to now start dissecting this defense. Pre-snap reads, you've got to do those things so you can actually get yourself and get this team moving. So once people get the the hang of what Allen likes to do, he's going to have no choice but to do that. So when you have Cole Beasley's and you have your, your smaller receivers, he's going to have to now use – Use that 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 skill set of using his accuracy, getting the ball across, and so on and so forth. So people are now have to they're gonna see that for themselves. And I hope I didn't speak too longly on this, but oh no, see that for themselves because that is going to make people love him a lot if he succeeds or start questioning, damn, do we have the right guy? Yeah. I think we do, but it's gonna be a big thing to watch out for. This coaching staff, if you look on both sides of the ball, what did they do when they dra- when they drafted Allen? 16th they end up drafting Edmonds yes two guys that are physical specimens all mm-hmm. you gotta do is coach him up and then you'll get him in the right spot what I liked about the Allen pick was that uh, a lot of times in college he didn't throw to the running backs and everyone knew that and that's a, the easiest way I think Palmer even talked about that's one of the things that you need in order to increase your accuracy number one number two give me yeah give me yeah Take give it. me uh Allen it, because of the arm strength that he does have he can make a read late and still get the ball there and I, that's what that's what I love about it, and that helps him in his progressions. You want to talk about you know dismissing the obvious connection of Dable coming from New England, and then you get Beasley, a little shifty slot guy. I mean, w- what do you think he's going to try to do with that? Uh, the only thing, the only problem is he doesn't have a Gronkowski to work with. You know, you don't have a right. big, huge guy like that. Although the tight ends in in, in Croft's absence have been uh, making some noise in practice. Sweeney and Knox have been making some noise in practice, practice as well as Kroom when he's been there. Uh, the thing that I saw that was very poignant with with Dable last year and why I kind of gave him a quote unquote pass is that he didn't really have much to work with. The offensive line, the guys like the receivers that you mentioned, they were they were just abysmal. Now what do they do? They bring in all these toys. They're bringing all these toys for Dable and Allen to do. You bring in a whole – you try to revamp the entire offensive line. He's got a year under his belt. He's able to go through progressions a little bit better. But what is the one interesting caveat in there is Dorsey. Mm. You bring Dorsey in because while Dable is going to overlook Allen, Dorsey is, I think, and this is me being a conspiracy theorist, is going to overlook Dable because I don't know how a guy in Dorsey, when, when Dennison got the job, Dorsey in, applied for the offensive coordinator position. Now, now he comes in. So is he there to overwatch Dable if he happens to have a successful year and jumps to a head coaching position and now you're protected? Or is he there to work one up more one-on-one with Allen so Dable can handle the rest of the offense? What is really his role in this offense? And I'm lo- I'm loving what that is going to progress to if the Bills struggle the first four or five weeks. Now, I don't want them to struggle, but if they struggle the first four or five weeks, you may see Dorsey get a little bit more attention on this Bills team. Now, I don't want it to happen, but absolutely, that's exactly what's going to happen. Think about it, though, and and I've and I've talked to I've talked about this at length. Yes, you're listen, Mary. You're a one thousand percent correct. Okay, in this in in life, the and it's it's weird to say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Everyone has an agenda. There's an agenda. <laughs> okay, I don't care. Let's keep it a buck here. Everybody has an agenda. When you make a move, you made a move for a reason. Okay. So Dennison is gone, and Dennison gets the job, but you bring in a, a Dorsey that comes in and applies for the very job the following year you give to Dable. So then now the guy that applied for the job a couple years back is now on the team with a guy that you hired beforehand. So you got Dable that you hired. The year before Dable came through, uh, Dorsey applied for the job. So you you considered him. To run this offense now you have him helping with your quarterback if Dable doesn't get this team together with all the weapons the groceries that McBean have put together for for my man Dable this is where Ken Dorsey starts to kind of elevate himself now you did you did two things there you said either Dable is a candidate for a head coaching job and he gets a head coaching job somewhere else which you never know it's possible it always happens yeah relationships he's got relationships with a lot of people out there and people like him so then it, it's easy. Ken Dorsey moves up and is the offensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. But I also think that Ken Dorsey is also there to say, hey, if Dable doesn't get his act together and Dable gives us the first seven weeks of last year, 
and he gives us that, um, yeah, we have a problem. Here's another thing. One thing that we you you mentioned Ken Dorsey, but without mentioning Ken Dorsey, you've got to mention David Cully. Yeah, David Cully, the offensive, uh, excuse me, the quarterback coach, which is really a receiver coach. See, this is where I, I it racks my brain. Why? I know what McDermott did when he first came in. He wanted to bring in a staff that is that a veteran staff that have been around the league a long time because he's gonna he's restarting this whole thing. So he wants guys with a football mind. But don't put the receiver coach as a quarterback coach with a rookie quarterback that you that you traded up to the seventh spot for. Come, this is where it, the, <laughs> McDermott blows my mind. So you can't you can't the blame goes on McDermott as well. He made some. Oh yeah. Coaching. I mean, he filled out his staff with guys that he knew. I mean, that's obviously going to happen. Guys that he knew, guys that he was comfortable with. But then he could then start going out to get uh, coaches that not that he's comfortable with that he knows can get the job done. And and obviously, everyone puts that blame on McDermott. No one's dismissing yeah. him from that from from the hires that he's made. I think by having that though, what he was thinking about was trying to get the quarterback and the receivers on the same page and have the offensive line because you know Bodine last year was making all the line calls. Yes. Usually, when you have a more seasoned quarterback, he's the one that can make the line calls for you and, the, and set the protections. If you have the if you have the quarterback, a la Mitch Morse, making those line calls for you, then it it, it makes uh, it cuts almost Allen's job in half. Does he have to know where the protection is? That's all. He needs to know where the protection is sliding. Okay. Absolutely. Now I know where to look where my reads are. So and, and that and that's what it comes down to. So that's why I had to pause myself a little bit <laughs> uh, and and allow Dable to really do his job this year. Yeah. But I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical because I'm going to be waiting to see what this man is, is about. You've got your groceries. You've got a nice new quarterback coach. You have a second-year quarterback in Allen that's going to be doing his thing. So this is it. we got to see what's <laughs> going on. I know it's year two, yeah. but we are watching. We have had poor quarterback play for a very long time. We finally have our guy. Please give him what he needs. Give him the line that he wants, and we can make things happen. Do my Batman, God, leave man. <laughs> I know my granny, she's upstairs and she's calling my name. Oh, I'm busy. <laughs> I can oh. tell because your speech starts to increase when uh, when she calls you. <laughs> Rico, uh, last last point before I let you go. I know you're a busy man. Uh, if we're talking about expectations, uh, we obviously we beat to death with the expectations for Allen is this year. Some people have him pegged at 4,000 yards. Some people have 3,200 yards. Some people have eight rushing touchdowns. Some people have him rushing for 1,000 yards. I mean, it's all over the place with the expectations yeah. of this kid and this offense and the defense. Uh, given we were given a little taste of it in the blue-red practice with guys going up against each other, depth guys getting a look, and it was great. What? Let's try to shorten up the stick a little bit and say, listen, what is your expectations Thursday against the Colts for this Bills team, what are you looking to see on offense? What are you looking to see on defense? Um, offensively, I'm looking. I'm looking at the cohesiveness of this O line. I want to see how well they can protect um, very little of Josh Allen because I don't think he's going to get a uh, a lot of play time. Maybe a series or two, if that. Yeah. Uh, how well depth guys protect Barkley, and I'm nobody's really talking about this, but I'm very curious to see how Tyree Jackson is going to do in this game. I really am. I want to see um, how well he does, only because when it comes down to picking you 53, is he a guy that's going to be your third quarterback on the active roster, or do you do you place him on the practice squad? So his play will truly allow us to find out where the vision is um, for Tyree Jackson. Um, we know that Singletary is going to be uh, do well. Tommy Sweeney. Yeah. One, that's one name that I'm going to be looking at as well uh, to see how he's doing because I've been hearing good things. All he's doing is taking advantage of the time that he's been permitted to be on the field due to injury. So it'll be nice to see that. Um, but the offensive line is my main key, how they they gel, how they're, they're communicating with each other and how they protect that quarterback. Um, defense. You know what? My X factor for this defense, and it's, and it's – it's tough to say because not this person's not going to get a lot of playing time. But Star Latule is nobody's talking about that important cog to this piece, <laughs> um, and, and people want to laugh. But I'm telling you right now, he's he's an important. He, he's going into his second year with his team. I think he's going to um, to really open up this defense. And by open up, I'm talking about open up for Jordan Phillips, open up for Ed Oliver, open up for Tremaine Edmonds coming behind him. So Starla Tule, but because it's the Indianapolis game, 
Uh, I want to see if Voshan Joseph is going to step up. I want to I want to yeah. see Mike Love is going to make a name for himself. Um, and Daryl Johnson a little bit. Yeah, but Johnson back- has been looking good in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Defensive backfield, I'm not worried about. I really am not. It's the front the front guys, but Mike Love. Uh, and uh, Volshawn Joseph are my two guys I'm going to be paying attention to. What about you? What are you uh, looking at? For me, as far as if I can start with the defensive side of the ball, I'm really interested to see how they're going to handle that CB2 rotation. Uh, how are they mm-hmm. going to talk about with, with the – is Johnson going to be in there? Is it going to be Keynes? Is it going to be Wallace? How are they going to rotate those guys? The other thing I want to realize, uh, I mean, if, if you're a fan of Hashtag Nation, uh, the thing that I always talk about and I always preach because he always gets hammered is Star Latule. I mean, it's gone to the point where Paul thinks I have a man crush on Star Latule because I know how important a defensive tackle is in this defense and how McDermott and Frazier want to run it. We're on the same page, man. <laughs> as far as the offensive side of the ball goes, I think it's going to be very poignant factor because if you go in there, you don't get a, a chance to see a lot of Josh Allen. And then you said Terry Jackson comes in. Two guys with a very similar skill set. Look at the plays that Jackson runs because a lot of those plays are similar to what Allen's going to be running in the regular season. It's going to be very vanilla. There's not going to be a lot of you know trickery in what the Bills are going to be running. They're probably going to run about seven or eight plays. They don't want to give every every team a look at what they're doing. But when Jackson does come in, notice the plays that he runs are the, are the bread and butter plays of this offense that Allen will also be asked to run. So that's that's interesting. Along with the line rotations, I'm very interested to see how the line rotations hold up and how they communicate as well. Rico, can't thank you enough for your time today. Uh, thank you for joining me. Hashtag Nation thanks you. If you, uh, if you guys are a fan of Hashtag Nation, please go over to Buffalo Fanatics. They are also on YouTube. They're on Twitter. His Twitter link is below his name. Give these guys yeah. a follow. Uh, for, I, for Rico, I am Mario. Thank you for joining us on Hashtag Sports today. Rico, I got to say one more thing, man. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, we've got so much content on, on social media and – a lot of the smaller brands are moving up, but just because they're smaller brands doesn't mean that they don't give you great content. Um, and hashtag these hashtag guys, uh, I I am a fan of the the car drives. I like it. It's new, <laughs> it's new, it's different, it's legit, and you can literally just talk. Yeah. I like it. Man. We almost made that happen, man. It's not it's not too late. We could always make another. <laughs> we could always make a, some kind of like meeting where. <laughs> hey, would you come? Would you come to Buffalo for your for the game? We'll definitely do a drive. We'll definitely. Man, we can do something. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna be there for the season open. Boys, man, you guys are doing a great job. You guys are slowly growing. I see it. Everybody sees it. Just keep putting that content on me. You guys are doing great. You as well, Rico. Thank you for joining me today, buddy. I'll talk to you.